Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I am so excited for this episode. If you're listening right now, I know most most of the consumption of this show is audio only, but you might want to have a look on YouTube or Spotify, take this in, or maybe check it out on Instagram, check out some of the uh, highlights. I know that you guys like watching a few clips on there at HWA pod because uh, we have uh, we're doing a special fancy production today. My friend Chris with Huga House Productions has been shooting a bunch of stuff gearing up for um, the Mind Under Matter Campout Festival and doing a bunch of fun stories on artists and scientists and stuff. And so we have a real legit amazing production today and I'm very excited and I'm especially excited to be talking with my wonderful guests. Anne McLaughlin, who is the author of All Too Human. Thank you, Anne, for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, this is my first time in NC State. Really? So well, welcome. I, I think so. Go Wolf Pack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wolf Pack is that. Yeah, you have the to team? do two of them to make it a Wolf Pack. And now, is it? Is it? What team is it? Is it a? Uh, is it all their teams or Wolfpack? The pack? Wolfpack. We are the Wolfpack. <laughs> <laughs> You're underestimating how little I know about sports. I've never been to a game, so I oh, okay. also don't know very much about sports. Okay. But you kind of absorb it through the air all right. when you at university. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, so, what do you do? What? Tell us about yourself. Well, I am a human factor psychologist. I'm in the psychology department as a professor, and I've been here since 2007. Um, as a human factor psychologist, we also call that applied experimental psychology, which means that I do experiments to understand the capabilities that people have, but also our limitations. We have limitations in our perception, our memory, attention, and when we really understand those, we can uh, design the world around us to be better and to fit us, rather than trying to make ourselves conform to something that is maybe impossible because mm. our, our humanity doesn't allow it. It seems like... Yeah, it's, it seems like such an important field because we have these incredible technological capabilities and you're someone that's a engineer or computer programmer or something like that. And you can make these amazing things doing it in um, like my editor for my podcast uses a very complicated program um, and most people just wouldn't be able to use it, whereas now you can go on Instagram or whatever, and there's very intuitive mm -hmm. little ways. And it's maybe from a programmer or editor perspective or something that wouldn't be the ideal way that an expert would do it. But when considering putting That's something to the point. general public. And one of the things that we say in Human Factors is that the two things you need to know the most are you need to know the user and understand the person who's using whatever it is, operator, mm -hmm. user, person, whatever. Um, and then you need to know the task. And if you can truly understand those completely, then you can match them better. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of tools that allow us to understand exactly, you know, when you're using this editing software, what is every step that you're doing and what are the mental processes that you're using to decide to use different filters and different um, uh, controls? And how can you make that so that the things that you commonly use maybe are more easy to get to and maybe the things that are rare. But to know that, you have to know what's common and what's rare. So we always say that uh, a lot of times when you're developing software or something with computer science or some new technology, that people are really good at coming up with things that they can do. And mm -hmm. as psychologists, we always say, well, should you? you know? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and how can we make it fit the person? Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. And how did you first get interested in this? Uh, total chance. And that's the story of every human factor psychologist ever. Um, really? Nobody knows about this field. That's one of the reasons that I, I wrote that book was that nobody knows about us and we need to have better ambassadors to bringing, you know, what we do to the general public because it's all around you. Um, mm -hmm. For one thing, you know, just as a quick aside, everything you're looking at in this room, in any place you are, think about how many decisions went to making it. How big is that desk? What should it be made out of? 
How reflective is it? Are there sharp edges? How do you open the drawers? Like every single thing was a human decision. And that decision could be made well or it could be made poorly. So anyway, so how did I get back into this? Um, when I was in undergrad in a small liberal arts school in Texas, um, at the very end of my senior year, I was going to go and be in the Peace Corps, like people do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, OK, I'm a psychology major. I was an English major. And then I was a communications major. As a psychology major, I guess I'm going to have to do therapy or go to something that involves talking to people, which I really wasn't that into. <laughs> so I'm not good at that. And uh, so my very last semester, there was a class offered that was a seminar on human factors. And I never heard of it, signed up for it by accident. And as soon as I was in that class, I thought this is what I want to do. The first assignment was, and here I'll give you the assignment. What is a bad design? Think of something in your life that frustrates you every time you use it and describe why it frustrates you. What do you hate about it? Uh, I, I know I have a zillion things. What can I come up with off the top of my head? Maybe something in your car dashboard. Maybe something yeah. with how you change something on a bike. Uh, uh, software, yeah. software, podcast software. Endless computer things yeah. that I'm just like, no, thank you. I'm just not going to look. I'll just pay someone else to do this. What I know is a yeah. simple task and, and rather than have to learn this thing and it, endlessly frustrating with that. I'm also sometimes there's just good things that I can't believe they're not everywhere, like heating and cooling cup holders in cars. I have right. once. And it's like, why isn't that in every vehicle? <laughs> you know, a cup holder is actually a good example of a bad design I saw recently. Okay. So you put the cup in and if it's empty, the, the, the piece of the cup holder that sort of conformed to the size of the cup, it would, you know, expand. Mm -hmm. They were so strong that when you put a cup in, if it didn't have anything in it, it would shoot the cup out of the cup holder in the car because mm -hmm. it would push forward right. and shoot it out. And I mean, maybe they should have tested it with empty cups. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes people have empty cups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, so then, so, so then what, what do you, I mean, what beyond, Looking at that and being like, hey, that shouldn't be this way. <laughs> what uh, what kind of, how do you go about studying things like that? Well, so at our heart, we're usually cognitive psychologists. So mm -hmm. we want to understand basic principles of memory, basic principles of different kinds of attention, and really test the limits on that. And then because we're an applied field, we won't just want to study, you know, attention as a construct and, you know, only in a lab. We want to see how does that attention get limited in the real world? Mm. When do people screw up? How do they make mistakes? Um, what caused them to make those mistakes? And so by studying that, and really understanding it, then we can make predictions and say, OK, if you have a partially automated car <clears throat> and um, it's driving for you, we know that human vigilance is terrible. Mm -hmm. We know this from basic research and vigilance. We know this from applied research and vigilance. If you are trying to be vigilant and watch for something to happen, but you're not doing anything, that's as tiring as if you're working really, really hard. Mm. I so, remember they they had to change the interstates early on when they originally had the interstates straight in case there was a bombing or something like that. As best point from A to B is just yeah. a straight interstate, mm -hmm. and then everyone just started falling asleep we on do. the road, and it caused all sorts of accidents. So they intentionally put curves, <laughs> and you can't change people. You yeah. know, we can't change and make our brains better at vigilance. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is make different interventions in the world that mm -hmm. sort of get us to do what we should be doing and help us to be more vigilant by maybe putting things in there that keep you from having highway hypnosis. Or um, if you are trying to monitor whether your Tesla is doing the right thing, you're going to miss when it miss when it misses that red light, you're going to miss it because you've been trying to maintain this vigilance that you just can't do. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we, we could predict that ahead of time. I mean, unfortunately predicting ahead of time doesn't always keep people from doing it, mm -hmm. but we could say, okay, we can tell you that this kind of design is going to lead to people doing X, Y, or Z, and that we need to come up with at the very least some way to, you know, put a guard in place to keep that from happening, mm -hmm. that dangerous situation. And all you have to do is tell people the right way to do things and <laughs> right. problem solve. They'll just go about doing the right thing. I always say that 
I feel like part of being in my field is, um, you know, the story of Cassandra from Greek mythology. Uh, no. So um, she was uh, able to predict the future. And so she knew it was mm. going to happen and she could tell people. But her curse was that no one ever listened to her. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, I, I was going to ask, it was related to this when you were you were saying kind of it's a smaller. I, I had never heard of the term human factors until a few years ago mm-hmm. when I had some other human factors guests on. And as someone who's been doing this podcast for eight years and been very interested in science communication for a decade, I found that as much as I would love to uh, for people to care as much about octopus or something as I do, it just doesn't necessarily directly impact their lives. Whereas I feel like I can kind of sell people on, say, behavioral economics. You you tell people like a lavender smell, get them more sales or whatever. People people get very interested in science in a hurry if, if, if there's a very clear direct benefit to their mm-hmm. their lives and uh as we are meshing so much with technology it, it, it seems like a field primed to take off i mean don't don't human factors people get a fair well, amount of funding from i mean we've taken off in terms of you know jobs compensation consulting you know, all those things yeah but in terms of the public knowing what we that. do we're not as good at communicating that I so see. Uh, I was I was interviewed by the American Psychological Society a few years ago about our graduates. And so, you know, they're PhDs in psychology in all fields that come from the APA. So, you know, you've got people in clinic, all different types of clinical psychology, um, just you name it, they have it at APA. And so the interviewer said, well, what percentage of your graduates have jobs at graduation? And I said, well, 100 percent. I mean, before graduation, like they're getting snapped up as you know, mm-hmm. fast as you can put them out there. And she said, what? She couldn't believe it. Because mm-hmm. that's not the usual, I think, for a lot of um, psychology PhDs. And I said, yeah, I mean, Google, Microsoft, Apple, um, Lenovo, uh, banks, Fidelity Investment. I mean, you name the company and there's usually a human factors team there. But it's like it's a well-kept secret mm-hmm. because we don't really have undergraduate courses in human factors so people don't know about it. And if you happen to, that's the only way you'd even end up applying to grad school. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we almost can't create or can't have as many people earn human factors PhDs as the market wants. And is is there is is there ever kind of where corporations might want proprietary information if they're investing into human factors or whatever, mm-hmm. where maybe maybe that's yeah. is that an aspect of why some of it's not getting into the public? No, well, that does keep most of my students, once they graduate, from being able to talk about what they do. Mm-hmm. I've you know, had students Google X and um, mm-hmm. different Microsoft game studios and all kinds of places. And so that's part of it because they don't get to present their work. But they still be presenting it kind of to us. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like we just don't have a good way of, um, for example, just getting in the news. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you... you I'm sure you know that Apple is supposed to be really great about usability. Mm-hmm. Well, that's due to the human factor psychologists that work at Apple. But nobody makes the link between this really boring sounding label, human factor psychology, mm-hmm. and you know the more sexy term of UX, user experience. Mm-hmm. Most people are getting to know about UX. So most of my students end up working in UX. I see. But they're coming at it from really understanding how the human brain works and what you can expect and what you can't expect of humans so that you can design around that and design it better from the get-go and also ways of evaluating you know oh here's a new design where could it go wrong here's some very stringent evaluation methods to be able to figure that out and then offer very specific principles or guidelines to the designers to fix it and then try it again hmm, hmm. well I, mean, I think the word human in it helps a little bit because yeah. humans go like i'm one of those I'm you a know. human factor. <laughs> but yeah. it, sound, it sounds like there could be a whole field of like human, human factor, factor people where that study people <laughs> that study human factors to see what their, mm. oh, their, that's, that's their pretty human, meta. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what biases they're having that's leading them to not communicate to the I think public property. If you went to one of our conferences, we just have so much jargon. Mm. It's just jargon 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 and so it's really hard to break away from that and i feel like uh maybe requiring courses in science communication would be good 
Do you think it's, I mean, how new is the human factors field? It really started around World War II. Okay. Um, especially in aviation. Around. Yeah, one of the best stories is about um, one of the reasons our field, our whole field got started was that pilots in World War II were flying planes basically into the ground or having accidents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the American military's response to this was stop having accidents. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can see how well that worked. Right. Um, but what it really was due to was the design of the planes and the mm -hmm. controls in the planes. So it really start, started a lot in aviation. Um, for example, you'd be in you know one style of plane, and the three you know levers that you use, I'm not a pilot, would be you know A, B, C. Then you go to this other plane, and it would be B, C, A, mm. another plane, C, A, B. And so you're That's... you know imagine that every time you get in the car. The brake pedal's in a different place. <laughs> and it seems crazy to us now. Yeah, yeah. But it seemed normal then because, well, you know, in this plane, it makes sense because we can make the hydraulic line shorter here, blah, blah, blah. And then it was an engineering decision, not a human decision. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from an engineer's perspective, what makes yeah. sense is very different from a yeah. human perspective. Huh. That's fascinating. What, what about, so say you have a new product. Like, um, here's one that I, I have a dream product that's incredibly impractical and um no but i want one for myself okay. it's just uh it's just a shower with uh a bunch of basically hair dryers on it and then you just stand <laughs> okay. there afterwards and you're yeah. blown dry that's pretty much it so say i go and i make this thing what are what are some of the things that i want to start asking myself about the product going into engineering this great concept by the way. <laughs> um, so first you'd want to know the people who might be interested in this product, how do they intend to use it? What are their goals? So we really need to know them. What are their needs? Do they want their whole body dry, just their hair on their head dry? Um, do they care how strong the airflow is? Are they doing it with a shower curtain where it might blow the shower curtain? Or is this a sealed in shower? I mean, there's so many questions as to how they're going to use it. And so you do a careful needs analysis by you may be doing some ethnography, seeing how people take showers in their, and dry their hair now, seeing how your product might change that, um, and really studying what it is that they want so that when you make something, you're not making something that just you want. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, you can do that if you're rich enough. <laughs> yeah. um, and then if you can you know, get the idea of what their goals are, they say, okay, well, what is the What's the job of taking a shower? What, are, what happens in a shower? What are all the things you have to do? And will any of those things that you do in the shower interfere with the design idea that you have? Right. Is the, I don't know, I'm gonna make things up. Is this, are the soap suds gonna clog up your dryer and then blow on you as little bits and have little stuff all over you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, is it going to, uh, is the dryer going to make it too hot in the bathroom and it's gonna, you're fighting with the fan. I, I, I don't know what these things are, but you yeah. could follow all of these analysis methods, like basically doing like a task analysis and saying, here's exactly what the shower task is. Here's the drying task. What happens if we combine them? And then how does that match with the, the mm -hmm. shower takers desires? So you have to think about these things because there might be something that seems obvious, like, well, it's to yeah, dry it people. It always seems obvious. But yeah. then you, you think further about it. And it's like, well, it's not about dry people are getting dry one way or another. this is about the feeling of mm -hmm. how nice that air feels on them it's like a massage of sorts or something like that that's that could what be the an experience unexpected is. piece of it yeah. yeah i'll give you another example and I, this is not to be political this is ancient history mm -hmm. but um do you remember the 2000 election do you remember the the um butterfly ballots from florida yep so the design of this ballot, I don't know if you can show a picture or whatever, but um, basically instead of having name, 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 whole, 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 it was name, whole, name, whole, name, whole. And so they were, it was a butterfly in that it had names on both sides and the hole that you punched was in the middle for each one. Hmm. But what that looks like is that if you have, see the second name down and you're not really paying attention, you pick the second hole. Mm -hmm. But that second hole is actually the name on the other side. Okay. Yeah. And so people didn't pick the person that they intended to when they were um, yeah, doing the yeah. election. And this came from a really good place in someone's heart. Mm -hmm. So the designer of this was trying to make it so that you could have 
uh, the words bigger, that the names would be bigger because she knew that a lot of the constituents in this area were older mm -hmm. and might have trouble reading small print. Mm -hmm. So to make the print bigger, if you have two sides, you can have big print, big print, big print. So it came from a place of trying to accomplish one thing to let people be able to read it, but it violated the human expectation of the second name is the second dot or the second um, punch in everything else that I do. Mm -hmm. And so they, they did some follow up pretty fast experiments. I think it was in Canada afterwards where they had people in a mall and there's gonna be a Canadian election and they had these different ballots. They had the normal ballot, the butterfly ballot, they had people go in and vote. And then when they came out, they asked them who they voted for. And so they could test and see that yes, a appreciable percentage of people voted for the wrong person. Mm. They didn't vote for who they thought they voted for. Right, right, right. Yeah. Interesting. So what's your book All Too Human about? These, so it's these taking all things. these examples yeah. and uh, many more examples and trying to tie them to our normal life. So trying to tie them to events in the news, trying to tie it to uh, things that you experience on a daily basis. And each chapter is like a little piece of human cognition and then explaining that so that people understand the capabilities and limitations of that of memory, for example, and then saying, well, OK, now we understand memory a little bit better. What do we do with that? And that's the applied piece. That's the applied psychology piece that I care most about. And so, well, once you understand memory, maybe then you redesign how you do um, police interrogations. Mm -hmm. Once you understand human attention, maybe that's how you, you know, change your design of cars or your choice of, uh, you know, your choice of a rental car. Do you pick the one that has, you know, the automate, the, do you pick one that has a, an interface that's going to be maybe tricky or difficult? Um, not that you necessarily know that, or do you pick a different one? Um, that's actually not a really good example. Let me back up. So like, let's say you understand human attention and that, uh, we're very good at doing two things at once if it doesn't use the same resource. So I can listen to a podcast while cooking, but I can't listen to a podcast while responding to an email. Right, right, right. Or I can, you know, so you can do visual and spatial and mm -hmm. auditory and verbal. Those are all very different resources. So now you understand that they're different resources that mm -hmm. you have. And you can think about, well, what can people do together and what can they not? And then mm -hmm. you understand better. Why am I good at some things together and some things I absolutely can't do at the same time? That is fascinating because there's so much talk these days that that about multitasking mm -hmm. and just how... Uh, just incredibly bad. We are at multitasking and, and very much overestimate our ability to multitask, but it's kind of, I, I guess from the perspective you're sharing, context is everything. Mm -hmm. there, there are some ways in which, I mean, I love um, like listening to audiobooks while driving. Same. I don't, I don't like listening to audiobooks just sitting there and yeah. I don't like just driving. It's just not, there's just not enough going on. And man, I just get all of my best thinking done in the car and, and come up with so many ideas and things. Absolutely. And I've got two thoughts there. Yeah. Get me excited. So I had a lot of caffeine today. So right. um, first idea. So the first concept is, uh, you know, really this was, it was developed, the idea of multiple resources came around in the late seventies, but in terms of applying it, um, one of our most famous current psychologists, uh, Chris Wickens, developed multiple resource theory, which is a way to say ahead of time, OK, you have something that's visual and maybe it's words you're reading. And then you have something else that's visual and it's spatial, like sound or it's spatial where there's a light happening somewhere. How much do those conflict? You can calculate it. How much does it conflict with an audiobook? How much does it conflict? You know, so you can you can measure out. You can do that same kind of task analysis I was talking about, but say what resource is getting loaded so that which ones are getting overloaded. Mm. And then you can say, well, OK, well, what if I turn this thing that it was going to be two visual things? What if I turn one into listening? Then I'm going to not overload the resources as much. So now I've made a better experience for people. Mm. So we actually have you know, ways to do this and predict it beforehand and then also to test it after it's been designed to try and make it as good as possible so that you have your best chance at multitasking. But we're still really bad at multitasking. Right. Because um, most of the time what we're multitasking is competing resources. So we're trying to do too much visual stuff at once or too many, we're listening too many things at once or we're trying to switch between things too fast. So we're still going to get that penalty and you can calculate that penalty in, but then you can still make it as good as possible 
by using this theory. Hmm. I'm a task switcher and I yeah. know I've, I've seen the research. <laughs> I know I know that you're not supposed to, but boy, I get distracted very easily. Okay, so here's a question for you. So when you're listening to audiobooks mm -hmm. in your car, do you ever realize that you've been visualizing the thing in the audiobook and you haven't seen the highway in minutes? Yeah, or that I also didn't hear the audiobook for some amount of time. Because something happened, it, to, yeah. Yeah, so it goes it goes both ways. Yeah. yeah. So so that that's because some of the resources can be delegated in, in certain ways mm -hmm. and, and pull from other Yeah. So basically, you know, you've got this visual ability and you're paying attention visually. But sometimes, you know, that audiobook is so good it sneaks in. I hear this a lot with um, people who listen to games, sports games, because mm -hmm. they're seeing, you know, I, I can't do the voice, but the announcer is talking about who's running on the field and who's catching what. And they're not seeing what's in front of them. They're, they're just reacting the purely field. automatically because they are seeing the field. Mm -hmm. And so you actually can have a task or, you know, two things happening where you think one's auditory and one's visual, but the auditory one can become a little visual. So you mm. have to take that into account too. Hmm. What are the, uh, what are some of the other, um, uh, what are, what are some of those resources that you consider? Well, I mean, you could think of any sensory input. Okay. So, um, you know, haptic mm -hmm. feelings of touch, you've got sound coming in, but that sound could be divided into words. So understanding what I'm saying is different from, um, maybe you hear the slight hum of the AC system behind us and you know, it's over there. Those are two different resources that um, they're both coming in through your ears, but they're using different other attentional resources where one is spatial location and not necessarily information from language and the other is highly language. Hmm. Do you feel like you are, your research, does it make technology drive you crazier or? Because <laughs> I know what's wrong yeah, with it. Because you, <laughs> Yes, because I get super frustrated that why didn't they? <laughs> Do you ever just write companies and be like, hey, I study this stuff? Oh, I did do that recently. What was that for? <laughs> I wrote one of my my um, city council people about something. I'll have to think about what mm, it was. It, it's okay. Oh, it was it was the um, the bus website for showing where buses are in Raleigh. Hmm. I had a lot of thoughts. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, so, I, what are what are things that everyday people can take away from human um, factors research mm -hmm. that aren't people that aren't involved in changing the product in some way? They're just interacting with the products that are available to them. Are there? Yeah. Well, number one, um, I wish that people believed and understood that they have more power. So. I think a lot of people, whenever something goes wrong with the technology or something, even, it doesn't have to be a technology. I mean, even how you open a file cabinet is human factors, a door handle, mm -hmm. you know, is human factors um, that frankly, you know, you deserve to have something that works for you and fits you. But people tend to blame themselves when something goes wrong. They think, ah, oh, I'm just so stupid with this technology. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just can't learn this new thing on my phone. Oh, I don't want something to change, you know. And they're blaming themselves. And so I wish that we could eliminate that. Uh, we have a little phrase. We say, don't blame the user because it's not your fault. It's the designer's fault or mm. the, the team of designers. Um, so something should be made for you. And if it's not, don't accept that. Now, I say that as though I can, you know, demand Adobe Premiere be easy to use. And that has not happened. Mm. But um, in general, you know, as consumers, if, we, if we're going to live in a capitalist society, then don't support um, designs that are either harmful or unfriendly or don't work for you. Mm -hmm. How hasn't Adobe Premiere has an, about three updates a day and <laughs> not one has got it to work properly? It's kind of insane. Um, so if, can you run down like the table of contents for me of your oh. book? Gosh, yeah. Table of contents. All right. You don't so, need to remember it perfectly. Just, just. So okay, you're going to, are you going to quiz me later? More of an idea. No, <laughs> not at all. 
Uh, also, with the first chapter, it's really about how we interact with automation and how automation can help us and how it can also hurt us. And so the example I use there is the miracle on the Hudson where Sully Sullenberger landed mm. plane unexpectedly on the Hudson and all the things that went into that in terms of the automation that was supporting he and his co-pilot and the things that were working against him. Um, I remember seeing when that happened, uh, he was on The Daily Show afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking to John Stewart about um, the, that they used to have a procedure manual that would, you know, you quickly get to emergency and planes going down. And that to save costs, they'd taken off the tabs that allow you to easily move between sections. Ooh, and wow. so <laughs> all, of a sudden, all the savings. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you have to think about that. And, yeah. and later on, I was talking with um, a friend who's, whose dad was a pilot. And said that, oh, yeah, they're just moving to have everything being a one PDF on an iPad. And I thought, well, has anyone thought about moving between places in the PDF? And you know, I had so many questions about it that would that would be just like that. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about, you know, you can get this amazing benefit from things like a system that's keeping your altitude constant while you worry about big problems. Mm -hmm. But um, at that same time, there can be a penalty for maybe depending too much on a one piece of automation. And if it ever fails, not noticing that something happened with it mm -hmm. and how we can design around that. So mm -hmm. that was the long winded chapter one. But no, it's just to throw uh, us into it's, it. It's, and it kind of reminds me of the, the self-driving car as well. Cause mm -hmm. it's, it, I mean, where my, um, when I, when I moved to Boston in, 2003 i did some like delivery stuff and i started comedy and it was you'd have map quest at the time but it was before <laughs> yeah. having gps's um, and i really got to know everything really well and knew my way all around new england really really well in a very short amount of time and um i've been here for months there's no way i could get home without a gps i if I'm further than a mile from my house, I don't think that I could right? find it. Because you didn't, yeah, without automation, you had to do it. You and, had to learn it. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there's just going to be uh -huh. lots more stuff like that happening. Yeah. It? I had a great automation problem with MapQuest back in 2003. I had an internship in Florida. I was coming down from Atlanta. And so I printed out the MapQuest directions. And because it was 2003 and printers were expensive, I just printed the text. I didn't mm -hmm. print the map. And so I just was blindly following, you know, the instructions, you know, in my car, like, okay, drive 17 miles, turn right on I, whatever. And I thought, gosh, this is taking a long time. Wow. Um, so I guess I accidentally chose avoid highways. And mm. so it took me all the way to the Atlantic coast to get from Atlanta to Orlando, which is basically one road. And then all the way back across Florida. Whoops. But I had no way to check back then. I yeah. didn't have, you know, we didn't have, a smartphone there was no way to look i just had to follow this um thing that i printed out yeah yeah huh um cool so that's chapter yeah. one uh chapter two is all about how cognitive biases creep into our lives mm -hmm. and i use the example of the flint water crisis as an example of how people see what they want to see and that that can have really harmful consequences when you're making policy decisions about like a whole town for people can you explain that a little better? Yeah, so the, the I, there are all these emails between the governor and the Department of Health and Human Services. And um, if you look at them, they basically have already said, you know, we, we think the water is safe. And so they're looking for every evidence that they can find to support that conclusion. Mm -hmm. And of course, the water wasn't safe. And so they're ignoring anything that goes against their um, preconceived notion and a lot of the things fit with what they expected from Flint, mm -hmm. that it was a, a poor town. And so, well, maybe the water doesn't look perfectly clear, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the pipes are old, but there's nothing wrong with them. These people are complaining too much. And so they had all these ideas about just the, the, the zeitgeist of what was going on. And then they only look for things that confirm that there was nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So that confirmation bias is my favorite example. Um, but you see it reasoning too going on there. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then of course you see that also with the idea of whether we had weapons of mass destruction with Saddam Hussein and you know, that, that caused a whole, um, you know, government area of 
yeah, IARPA to be born because they wanted to have research projects to see how could we have been so wrong about that. Mm. And so because it's an applied chapter, so I go over all these examples of, you know, in the, in the news, where is the bias coming from? What, how, do, you know, how can we know it when we see it? And then uh, at the end, I have some examples, like here's a, a method that you can use to make sure that you're as least biased as possible. So it makes you look for disconfirming evidence mm. to your theory. So if you have an idea, it forces you to look, it's, it's a process for saying, okay, now I have to say, what would disprove this? And right. I have to say, can I find that evidence and go look for it? I think that's one of the single greatest things that that scientists do and try to at least try to incorporate into um, into their work. And it seems uh, that's one of the most important things that I wish got out to the public quite a bit mm -hmm. more is the idea of making things falsifiable and the idea of like, well, it, if we were to bet on this, how would we decide who won? There needs to be like, is there Bigfoot or not yeah. Bigfoot? Well, if Bigfoot shows up, <laughs> I lost the bet. That's congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and if, but if it doesn't show up, that you just get to keep on. Like, there's no way mm -hmm. for me to win the the bet that I don't believe that Bigfoot exists. So there's nothing false oh you haven't been to app state then <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. need to go over to boone <laughs> right um, oh they're, they're all yeah. over the place yeah exactly so i i feel like that kind of thinking humans don't think that way naturally mm -hmm. we don't think in terms of looking for disconfirming evidence quite the opposite so uh, we need a process or a tool in place to help us do that and so um you can't expect people to do it if they're not trained to do that in fact, scientists aren't great at it either. Mm -hmm. We're human. We want to see something. We expect to see something. And maybe we're not as good at looking for the disconfirming evidence. And we should be. So, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to expect everyone in the world to suddenly have this skill when we don't really teach it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, what could people do to... Do you have, like, a series of questions that you ask yourself to... To try to just, just what you said. I mean, just start with that. Yeah. You know, if I were making a bet against this, what evidence would I need? Mm -hmm. And if you can't come up with something, well, you're dealing with the belief, not a fact. Right, right, right. Interesting. Okay. So that was chapter two. Yeah. <laughs> so right. a, uh, chapter three is all about creativity and how um, diverse thinking gets us around some of those biases. So if you have people around you who think differently from you, have different backgrounds, or just in general different, then you tend to notice that, and so do they, and then you don't expect that everyone's thinking the same. And so that can make for much better group discussions, group decisions, um, teams, and uh, just really can show a lot of biases that would have just slid through if mm. everybody assumed everyone thought like them, and then it seemed like they did because everybody just stays quiet. So introducing right. that, um, element in there is a really good way to make your teams better. Right. Yeah. It's always the most confident person too. Uh, that's uh, the Dunning Kruger. The, I can think of always one, the loudest. I can then, think of one uh, particular podcaster that gets that very confident. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I don't want hate mail, so I won't. Oh, uh, whatever. And, and then just kind of uh, yes. I, I mean, I know from. I have a couple of people in, in my extended family that are the loudest ones are also the most confident, usually the most wrong and have <laughs> no idea that everyone else is just biting their tongue. And, they think everyone agrees with them. Well, and then uh, the the scary part, too, is then some people are like, oh, do, do we agree uh, with this? No How one else say is it? saying that. Maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe I guess everyone's on that. And then we just, we have such social brains that. And then you ruin Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, so what can people do to foster um, kind of diverse points of view within, um, within teams or within mm -hmm. collaborations? How do you go about, because I, I know from various experiences I've, I've, worked with people that see things vastly different than me and i've mm -hmm. also worked with people where we're on like the exact same wavelength and i've enjoyed and not enjoyed both experiences at different times 
Um, but diversity of thought is a really tricky thing to, um, to sort out. It's like, I or mean, mandate or, or mandate. Right? I mean, and it, it, well, say, yeah. say you were seeking it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's easy, you can be like, well, okay, someone's a different gender or different race or something like that. But there's a lot more going on with diversity of, of thought than these, uh, like the, the very easy um, visual cues. Well, the first thing you can do, I mean, this is the hard part, is create a culture where people feel, feel good about saying their thoughts, especially mm. when it conflicts with the person who seems super confident and spoke up immediately. Mm. And that's really hard to do. Um, there's a back in, you know, some of the earlier human factors work. Um, uh, one of the members of my dissertation committee, um, Dr. Uta Fisher, had uh, uh, did a lot of research on crew resource management, which really means how do people in airplanes communicate with each other? And some of the interesting literature there is uh, how the hierarchy of pilot copilot can be so terrible. The, the Asian uh, yes. study. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. I mean, you're willing to, <laughs> Horrifying. Die, you're willing to die <laughs> yeah. as a co-pilot rather than speak uh, keep Just speaking up. A very passive, sheepish co-pilot being like, mm, I don't well, know, that looks like we're maybe heading toward a mountain. <laughs> and, you know, you say it three times and then you just fly into the mountain. So, yeah. So, you know, we think, of, oh, well, that's that's wild. That's you know happening in this airplane and it's All these right. two people and it's this rigid hierarchy. Is that going to affect my life? Well, you bet it does with nurses and doctors yeah. and, and other types of healthcare right. workers. If mm -hmm. you've got that hierarchy where people feel like they can't say things, you're mm -hmm. going to have the same same problems. So you've got to create that culture, and that's hard. That's really hard. And I wish I had a how-to for that, but I don't well, have that. What do you think about the effectiveness of, um, of introducing say checklists and, and mm -hmm. two things like that, that mandate that no, you're thinking that like the, a human factor psychologist that the doctor has to, you know, the, yeah. the nurse is in charge of this aspect of the checklist. Mm -hmm. And so the doctors simply can't ignore what's being it's checked. Off excellent on intervention. Yeah. I, um, I was fortunate. I've been fortunate enough to work a lot with veterinarians at the college of veterinary medicine here. Cool. And it's awesome because, you know, as a human factor psychologist, they're using all the same tools as, you know, the hospital at Duke. They're using all the same procedures. They have yeah. to be just as skilled. It's not more what, so. What's the difference between a veterinarian and a doctor? A doctor, a doctor only uh, knows how yeah. to fix one, <laughs> right. uh, one yeah. species. <clears throat> but the other difference right. is HIPAA. I can observe a, a dog oh, procedure. Right, right, I can observe right, right. a surgery, see how they're doing it, see what they're doing, how they communicate. And I don't have to worry about, uh, it's not your surgery. I'm not, right. you know, there's not a human there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I can see, okay, uh, one of the things we noticed was the difference in, you know, how long it took uh, a resident to, you know, you sort of press this, this pedal to use x-rays to see what's going on while you're in the heart. And the, the residents would stomp on it and watch. And so the whole time you're doing that, there are x-rays in the room. And it's very small, but, you know, you want to minimize that. Right. Whereas if a faculty member who'd been there a while, they just basically did a flash and then they knew exactly where they were, what to do, a flash. Uh -huh. And so then the question is, can we come up with ways to get the residents faster into this really quick acting, um, recognize what they see and what they're doing? And can we do that without them having to actually use x-rays to practice? Right. So things like that were, <clears throat> there's so many things. And so one of the things that they came to us with was they really wanted just to help them with a surgical checklist. Hmm. So we spent um, a year look, working with them, observing procedures, working through the checklist, iterating, and then we deployed it and measured, you know, how well it was accepted. There's a great publication we got out of it. Um, and now they have this checklist they've been using for four years now or five years. Mm. And one of the biggest things in the checklist was um, basically, you know, a cardiologist uh, reviews expectations for this procedure. How long do you think it's going to take? Why? And the whole purpose of that was to um, basically the team would work OK together, but the cardiologist would assume that everybody knew what they knew. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the case, but nobody wants to speak up and say, well, I, I don't actually know exactly what's going on. But by putting that in the checklist, 
then everyone's on the same page. Oh, okay, this is going to be, the cardiologist thinks this is going to be a difficult case for these reasons. Um, so I have an expectation of how long it's going to take, how hard it's going to be, what to look for. So they got so much extra information that would have just been assumed um, if we hadn't had a checklist item that forced that to become a, a verbal communication. Hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, I, I love working over there. It's yeah, I, uh, I dated a veterinarian for a while, so I just saw what, uh, <laughs> what came in. But I was writing jokes with a beer cracked already and she would come home covered in oh, no. anal glands and stuff. And, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cool, I got to go in and sit in on some stuff sometimes, but yeah, that, that's that. I think the, it, how much do, when you say that they had you develop a checklist, um, that's interesting because it wasn't there kind of, a history of a lot of resistance against checklists where is it cause some of the cognitive mm -hmm. bias stuff going on is I know this with myself where if I don't write something down, it probably isn't going to get done. Even if I write it down, I'm, I won't, I might lose it if I don't mm -hmm. organize it in a certain way. And there's, uh, the trick of my mind to be like, Oh, I'll remember that. And <laughs> right. I'll remember this. <laughs> and there's not a chance. Narrator, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, but there's like a little yeah. bit of ego in there that, that I mean, I, I think, I That's think if huge. you're a doctor um, or something to go like, well, what do I need this stupid checklist for? I've been a doctor for 20 years. That's totally years. true. And you know, that, that was really, um, you know, we had, checklists and different kinds of we call them cognition aids and that's what i'm really interested in my own work um, mm. checklists and other types of aids to cognition in aviation for decades and made flying in a plane one of the safest things that you can do um, and really it wasn't until like 1999 ish when um, there's this big report called to air as human that came out about healthcare, and it basically decimated how many i mean just showed how many errors there are in medicine mm -hmm. and how there's a big problem and there's still some pushback um, and then maybe like the 2007, 2008, I'd say it's when the medical checklist really started to take off. Mm. Um, by the time I got to it in 2015 with the veterinarians, um, they were all in, they were hundred percent in everybody on the team wanted this checklist. Um, the anesthesia team then wanted a checklist. Like they, they really hungered for this, but I think that there was that like 10 year period where yeah, there's some ego there where doctor says, oh, I don't want you to tell me what my job is. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, you know, change that culture to show that the checklist is going to help. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it was maybe 2008 ish when um, there's a doctor researcher named Peter Provenost, I think up in the Midwest. And um, he developed a checklist for basically sanitizing. Um, I'm not a doctor, so keep in mind, this could be way off but sanitizing before putting in some kind of uh, line. So I think it was some sort of, I don't know, needle. And um, complications from this had been huge that, you know, this site gets infected all the time. I think it was in the groin area. So, and so he just made it like a few step checklist and put it in these hospitals. And it was something like, it's, it stopped so many complications that if the checklist had been a pill, it would have been the most effective pill ever developed in all time. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. But because it's a checklist, people are like, that's stupid, I'm not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. hmm. So you were mentioning some of the, the stuff that you've been working on, Could mm -hmm. you, do you wanna share some of that? Yeah, so I'm really interested in uh, cognition aids that you can either um, make us a little more superhuman so that we don't have those limitations of attention and memory and uh, biases and you know can try and get through all get rid of those limitations or at least subdue them especially when there's something in particular you want to accomplish um, but then it could also be you know cognition aid can also be if uh, let's say you're really distracted and so you're not at your best you're not even at your normal then what can we do to then bring you at least up to what we did expect if you didn't have all this other stuff going on and so the whole area is called cognition aids. And what interests me about it is really matching it with all of these different limitations in cognition that we have so that we've got this theory based way of designing them. And then we can deploy it in almost any domain. And um, one of the things I love about being a human factor psychologist is that I get to learn about all these different things. I mean, I'm over at the vet school watching a heart procedure. 
I'm, you know, uh, working with NASA, learning about, you know, emergencies on the ISS. I mean, so the, all these different things, and you have to learn about it and know the task, like I said earlier, to be able to then come up with, okay, well, here's how we can make that task easier. And so with cognition aids, the idea is let's come up with ways to make any job easier as long as we know what that job is. So what I'm working on right now is um, this concept of taking away distractions through something called diminished reality. And I have a collaborator at Georgia Tech who's a computer scientist slash computer engineer, and her team can uh, create augmented reality that let's say you're, I mean, we're not quite there yet, but let's say you have your augmented reality glasses on and you'd like to talk to me without the stress of all these cameras and microphones. Mm -hmm. Well, we could delete them so you don't mm -hmm. see them just looks like an empty room. Mm. Would that help? Maybe, you know, so my job as a psychologist is to say what would help and when, and then their job as technologists is to make it. Hmm. So to, um, so this is one, one of the ways in which you can, uh, help make me superhuman is just by eliminating the, and just simply taking out the Do unnecessary. So? I, I mean, this is, this is certainly a lot of what, evolution has been trying to do for a very long time with everything right you know i mean it's, yeah. it's we have our attentional biases for lots of uh lots of wonderful evolved reasons but we're in a pretty different modern world now, that is, now. you've hit the nail on the head yeah. i mean in maybe in the past you know we think about the way our eyes work which is chapter 10 no chapter nine <laughs> mm -hmm. so the way the eyes work is you know you have your focal area which is really good with color and fine detail and then you have you know, your periphery which is really good with light and motion you know if someone moves over there and someone just did then mm -hmm. you catch that because your your detect your detectors are really ready to go yeah well what if that's you know maybe if something's flying at your head you need to duck right but if you're trying to work in an open office situation and your coworkers are walking by Right. That's grabbing your attention, whether you want it to or not, and taking a little bit of attention away from what you're trying to focus on. So maybe they shouldn't be walking by. Maybe you could, you know, you change put the horse them. blinders on. Maybe. Well, it's essentially that, but without <laughs> that feeling of wearing horse blinders. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um. That that's interesting. So so that's something. So that's something, and it, because you show me some of these cool VR goggle simulation things and everything um, that um, a lot of people aren't ever going to do a VR simulation in their life. But but that's it, arranging a cubicle in a different way um, to help with your work attention is something that people can be more mindful of. And, yeah. and I guess, it, yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't really occur to you. You don't normally think, well, my vision over here is different than my vision here. And there's different factors that are that are shifting my attention. Yeah. So that's why it's good to know about you know the basics and the theory. But if you think about it, you've probably done you probably diminish your reality all the time. I mm -hmm. mean, do you ever wear noise canceling headphones? Mm, yeah, some. Okay. Do you yeah. um, you know, do you ever uh, let's see, what would be another good one? Um, do you ever try to uh, are, so you're merging on the highway? Do you stop talking to your passenger because it's too much? Yeah, yeah. Or you're looking for a place to turn and you turn down the radio, mm -hmm. even though you're just looking for it, you know? Yeah. So you're you're doing a lot of these things naturally. And um, I, I was sitting next to a woman on I went to a conference last week in Minneapolis, which is a cool city, by the way. Yeah, great. Very artsy. And um, <laughs> there were two babies in the aisle behind us crying and just screaming. And so mm -hmm. we're about to get started. And she turns to me and she says, if you need to get out, you just tell me I'm taking out my hearing aids. <laughs> I thought, well, I'd like to do that. Yeah, yeah. So she was, you know, she decided right. to diminish her reality to be able to concentrate on her book that she was reading. It's so counterintuitive in some ways, because you would think if you, if you talk about becoming superhuman or you watch a show about superheroes it's always yeah. you're always adding on extra abilities you want more more powers more strength more vision and so this idea of actually eliminating things is really neat and we're looking at that too so you know um some of our experiments are just on diminished reality because we want to isolate it and see what the benefits are 
but then some of them are on augmenting reality. Mm -hmm. So um, my colleague, um, Mary Beth Gandy at Georgia Tech, she's done studies with, you know, you've got augmented reality. Let's say you are a healthcare worker and you're trying to clean up um, a biohazard mess. And maybe it was a fluid that's clear. Well, did you get it all? Mm -hmm. So what if you could augment it and you see it's green now? So now you can really make sure that you clean it up. Interesting. Um, or you walk into a, you know, a giant Amazon warehouse of all the servers and one is dead and it's, you know, XP3, one, th whatever. Well, you put in your glasses and now it's glowing green on the aisle over there with a little line from it. And you just walk over there and fix it. So there's no searching, there's no consult, you know, so it takes a lot of steps out and makes your job easier. So many of those, and all of those are adding something to the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think eventually our idea is that we're gonna create this toolkit for designers to use where you can augment things so maybe, you know, if I can't remember your name, there's a little line that comes out. And was, oh, <laughs> that'd be so nice. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so yeah sign me up. I'm happy to become a robot any day just for that skill. <laughs> and then maybe there's a, a you know, a, a remapping that happens mm -hmm. where you're talking to me, but because there's so much other noise going on, I can't hear you. So now I get a closed caption. I can read it. So I've mm -hmm. changed. I've remapped it from audio to visual. Um, and then maybe there's also a diminishment where maybe we can cancel out some of that noise or um, remove some of the things that are going on in the environment. So putting all those things together into basically a toolkit that technologists could use, but also with good principles and guidelines about how to create things that will actually help people and not accidentally hurt them or mm. hurt what they're trying to accomplish. Hmm. What do you think is, is some of the, some of the future of, kind of some of the next steps, what you expect to see in the next five years or when, when you really get thinking about 20, 100 years from now when we're all perfectly focused cyborg people. Um, <laughs> oh, what are the steps before that? That would be definitely be a better question for my colleague, Mary Beth, because, um, you know, I, I just deal with the human side of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do anticipate that at some point, you know, I'm going to be that old professor who's got the PowerPoints and the students are like, I can't believe she's still using PowerPoint. Where's yeah. my hologram? You know, right. right. Um, but I think like the next step, you know, you remember when Google Glasses came out mm -hmm. and didn't really do much because, you know, they just had a very limited display and they're getting better and better. They're getting much better already. So um, I could imagine in five years, at least you've got something that's matched to a particular thing you want to do. One thing that um, we want to do more experiments on, we did a, a little pilot study, was um, like, let's say you're in an auditorium and there are 200 students in the class and you're trying to listen, you're trying to pay attention, you paid your tuition, you want to do a good job, but everybody's got their laptops up and things, you know, so one person's playing ESPN and so things are moving. Well, it's in your periphery. It's going to grab your attention. Someone's next to you whispering to their neighbor. They're asking for a pencil. So all these things are happening and you're trying so hard to concentrate. Mm. Those seem like those, that, that's a pretty limited environment. You could probably have, you know, glasses that you wear that at least just blank out everybody's screen and maybe subdue all audio that's not the professor, unless mm. maybe your name is said or something like that. Because um, as a psychologist, we're also interested in well, how does that affect your awareness of your whole situation? You know, the blinders might seem like a good idea until everyone doesn't ever ask you to lunch because you never know what's going on. Um, mm. So how do you maintain some kind of situational awareness while still getting the benefit of the uh, diminishment? Mm. So what's, what's one of your favorite projects that you've ever done or that you're working on now? Well, okay, what I'm working on now is trying to um, study this diminishment angle in regards to the how much does it harm your situation awareness and can we find a balance? Because when I say, you know, I'm just describing these ideas for, you know, taking distractions out of your world, that all sounds great, but we still don't know what should it look like. Do I just delete Chris over here? Mm. Or does, is it better if he's blurred out? Is it better if when he moves, that's what's blurred out? So you don't really see motion, but he, you know he's still there? All these questions are what we put in the category of human computer action or HDI questions. How do you literally design it? What should it look like? Mm. And so I'm really excited right now about exploring those. Um, we have a project where 
we basically put you into an emergency environment with all these kinds of alarms going off and people telling you things and you're trying to do this new thing that you've never done before and it's really hard and really stressful. Um, and then we're going to diminish it in many different ways and see what gives us this best balance and why with um, still knowing maybe what's going on with the important stuff, but maybe not, not always knowing what everything is going on. Whereas we expect that with the, you know, the control condition, you might know more about everything that's going on, but you're not going to do your job very well. Mm -hmm. So trying to get a, a balance there. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be really cool. Yeah. I failed miserably. <laughs> doing, you can fail again if you want. Yeah, I'd ha happy to. <laughs> um, so as we wrap up, what are, what are one or two or, or three kind of main takeaways you'd, you'd hope people would have from your book? Okay. Number one, there's this really cool field out there called human factors. And before you fall asleep, listening to the words human factors, hear me out. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. And it, it touches everything. It touches everything from how do we design interrogations of, um, or not interrogation, questioning of uh, children who witnessed a crime. It goes all the way from there to designing the airplane interfaces for, you know, how can a pilot be the most fuel efficient to uh, the Flint water crisis. I mean, it, it, it covers everything because humans are everywhere. And if you can understand how humans are limited, not only does that give you empathy and really understand where people are coming from and why they seem like they're failing, because um, then you can say, well, it's not because there's something wrong with them. It's just because there's something wrong with all of us. We, we're just, we can't do this thing. And so we can't expect that from somebody. And then I want people to take the takeaway that that means we shouldn't be expected to do the impossible. We are all very human and we can't improve ourselves to a point that we can escape that. Mm -hmm. So maybe technology can help us, but badly designed technology shouldn't be accepted and that we should, um, we should feel like we shouldn't blame ourselves. We should demand better from our products, our systems, our governments. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is show. really fun. Yeah. And McLaughlin, everybody. And uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon. That's how the, all of this is able to happen. So, uh, Patreon.com slash Shane Moss, M-A-U-S-S. -S. And thank you all for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk to you next week.